thank you so much for your introductions. And, and in a way, they all move me <coughs> differently. And, um, you know, one, I believe my key takeaway of what you said, Aaron, was be annoying, you know, and have the guts to be. And, and also, I believe that you're, you're embodying, Daniela, uh, that also within your own organization and, and, and utilizing the power of design to make these fundamental changes. Um, and a topic that has been keeping me busy for a long, long time has to do with um, innovation, where we tend to look at the world as is, the situation as is, the status quo, and then we attempt to incrementally improve it. And the thing is, if you want to go from something to something entirely different, the incremental approach is probably not going to cut it. So what does it take for systemic innovation to occur? And which, which is basically, um, you're, you're going to make a mess out of your belief system first. And about who am I and what am I? And wonderful <laughs> questions, Walter, to start with. I love the, the heart-shaped Excel, if, if that is who you are. Um, and, but and also, one of, one, of, one, of, one of the keys, I believe, to that systemic innovation is to embrace something that I would call feminine leadership. Because we live in a very male-dominated world where, where, of course, you know, there's many women, but the design, the design principle of the of principles of the systems that we're a part of are not feminine. And I wanted, I wanted to ask you to reflect upon that. So what, what do you feel with that? And, and how can we design organizations, societies, companies in such ways that they would, they would allow a lot more by design for feminine leadership to be a part of them? It's a big question, isn't it? There are like 15 questions you ask now. <laughs> sure. Well, there's 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, do you, who do you want to take it? All of you. You can take One, it first. One, two, three. Yeah. No. I, I take it. Yeah, okay. you can. Um, we have in our organization a big push to um, bring diversity to the company. We did a very big study um, with some pretty fancy consultants, uh, and they told us to be on par with uh, German Dach companies, you need to get your woman quota from 19.5 to 25%. Last year was the big sustainability environmental push. This year is the S of the ESG, and we're doing social, and this is um, an extremely important part. For diversity, we are a very diverse company with regards to uh, LGBTQ and all of this, we have a huge amount of crews, you know, th there's uh, a huge amount of diversity, we have international people, but we really struggle on women in management, and there are huge programs, um, where all of the people who are high potentials are given now extra special kid gloves, which the men are not receiving, in order to tip us up into management. When we go through these programs, however, and, and, and it's, uh, it's embodied and everybody puts down all of the female leadership characteristics and I embody a lot of them, most of them actually, I am a woman after all, this is the way I tick. Uh, but then when you go in through these tests and through these job interviews for these top management positions, um, then some of the ways that I, I failed miserably last week, uh, I got a big bloody nose and I uh, didn't want to tell you about it, but I will. Um, and w how did I fail? Maybe I'm not as structured as some people. This is my personality. I don't think it's about being a woman. It's about my personality color or whatever. But I failed also because I was too crazy. My ideas were too far out there. Um, when I discussed what I wanted to do with this job, you're, uh, Aaron, you want to create a whole new system. And it was my disruptiveness and, and it was those qualities. I don't know if this is a female quality. The, the thing about empathy and um, collaboration and all of these things, I think I'm hitting them very well. But when you're now talking about 
this breakthrough moments of getting, getting, getting into these upper levels, they want uh, analytical, safe, risk-averse management, I think, in many jobs, in many cases. And I, I think that this is maybe um, an issue. I don't think that it's a woman problem, necessarily. I think that there are certain characteristics that uh, we maybe have in droves, but I think that there's something else going on as well. This is like a, um, we say we want something new, and yet, when it comes down to a decision, there's a lot of status quo decision-making which does not represent, this is the new company that we want to be. This is what we bought from BCG and this is what we're going, so that's a kind, maybe a bit, maybe a bit T, TMI, <laughs> but. No, no, thank yeah. you. No, I mean, I, no, it's definitely not too much information. Thank you. So Daniela. Well, I mean, I totally agree. And we had these conversations before. Um, but I also think it's not, I mean, I was putting this a, a little bit in my, my talk, that it's not only about, uh, uh, it's not about being a woman and behaving like a woman. What is the women behavior if you are working in a company which is engineer driven because we don't have too many young women who are studying this. So there is, it's, it's a lack of uh, young students going into these kind of topics. Sustainability is actually the topic now where we are, um, where we can see that there are a lot of uh, female coming up and being interested and much more bold and much more brave than a lot of colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I can see that um, if you want to make a change within the company, it is about you being clear on a vision and being also convinced that it's not about your personal growth, it is about the things you want to change within the systems. And if you do that, that's what I said, I'm, uh, it's uncomfortable. And a lot of uh, people just don't like to be uncomfortable in these kind of companies, but you can make a difference. It just seems too unpractical or something. And you're fed with a nice paycheck maybe because it's like the huge corporations and you can hide somewhere. I just moved on to another position two months ago to be uh, in the innovation department. And one of my uh, mentors told me, hey, it's perfect. You can hide in this position as long as you want, as long as you go. Because we ha I know we have a lot of people who are hiding in these positions. They are doing something, and nobody knows exactly what they do. But they're not too loud. Uh, but sometimes, strategically, they come up. And you're like, what? But how can they do that? And how, how is a company supporting this? It happens. So, but this is not my personal goal, because I want to change something. And I think that's a lot of things where I see when women are mm -hmm. much more, they are braver. I think I can see in my company a lot of very brave women, but we have to collaborate a lot. We really have to connect and collaborate a lot. We just met and we figured out that we have to meet, we have to bring each other into our companies <coughs> to get this kind of exchange. I don't know why it didn't happen before, but it will. But soon. <laughs> Soon. And our companies are, we could be working for the same company with one. Uh, it sounds like it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Or yeah. found your own. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Walter, do you have any takes on, 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 you know, on my 15 like questions? <laughs> yeah, but I no. can be basically very simple because I'm probably coming from a different environment. I'm coming from a research institute dedicated to sustainability. We look also at diversity in numbers and, yeah, in certain engineering areas, there is more men working. But in fact, it demonstrates we should not make the con connection between sustainability needs, female virtues or what extra, no. Because if I look who is working down there, they're doing exactly the same spirit. I think in corporates, I agree with you, sometimes the atmosphere is very much by the pure financing thing. Financing thing, and I just noticed that many of them is still in the Excel thinking way. And basically, it has nothing to do with the sex of the person who's doing this kind of things, it's just mm -hmm. dominated with a certain way of thinking. So I, I would try to uh, avoid using it because now you put a label also. Are you a woman? So by yep. definition, you should be thinking. It's not true. Mm. I think every day in, in our organization, women and men demonstrate that doesn't need to be. Mm. So I think mm. we should avoid putting the label on it. But of course, we need to promote also the openness of certain hardcore guys' jobs for young girls also. I've got two daughters. 
I've got one who is also studying science. So I'm very glad about it. So I hope she can make down there. There is a space also for women in, in hardcore science areas. Absolutely there is. Mm -hmm. So don't put labels on it. Just promote young girls also to do these things. It's possible. Yeah. Thank you. Now, to, to, to take this a bit further, because all three of you, in a way, are also within your own organization. You're all working in large organizations. And, and all three of you, in a, in, 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 a, in a certain way, are also rebellious. You're also... Uh, but that, ta that can take a lot of effort. And, and, and I know from experience that, you know, you, you can actually run into walls there. And so... And then if these walls actually stop you, then, then a lot of potential is also stopped. So, what are, I mean, I, I kind of assume that these walls exist in every organization, right? So, um, but how do you deal with them? And, and be, be, because you're led by your vision, you're led by a desire to make a difference in the world or in your own life or in your organization. Um, so how do you keep that as your navigation screen in front of you and, 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 and feel empowered even though within your own organization sometimes you have to struggle. But you just gave the answer, yes, you have to have a strong and a, vi a vision and you have to have a very long breath. You really, I mean, it took me 22 years to be there where I am now, um, but it was upon a strong conviction that I can have an impact there. If you can but it just takes for, it takes, I would always say it takes forever. But uh, you have to stand that. But yes, I know, I see a lot of colleagues who are leaving this path because for them it takes too long or they're getting a kind of kind impatience because it mm -hmm. didn't work out the way they want. Um, but I think it's everywhere the same. I mean, it's like, you, do you have a strong vision where you want to be, where you want to bring the company or the product or what do you want to see? What do you want to feel? Mm. Um, I want to be, telling my grandchild, if they ask me, my nephew asked me, what are you doing? You're working in a car company. He doesn't think it's super cool. He doesn't even want to do a driving license anymore. But I say, look, honestly, if you look at like 100,000 cars, having an, I made an impact because I changed material to a better, or I changed whatever. We try to change mobility behaviors as well. We work with the city of Rotterdam at the moment as a lighthouse city project to understand the needs of the city to design vehicles they want. It's not that we want to listen to them, that they tell us, get out of our city with the cars. We want to get prepared. So these are the projects you can envision and you can work with them. And you can really go in discussions and do a collabor collaboration. We were listening to that more often. It's m super important that you collaborate with stakeholders, with startups, with other companies, with cities to understand the problem. And what you showed, that is the issue. But we are not the enemy. Everybody wants no. to be mo mobile. Everybody, mm. everybody has more or less one car somewhere standing. And uh, I mean, maybe it's up to but you not I buying cars anymore. That could be the solution. But it's not probably my vision. <laughs> Yeah, but you, that's what you showed. You said, oh, like, the, the car is the problem. The, I didn't say the car is the problem. The, 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 the size of the car is the problem. It, no, there is a problem of space. And that's how true. do we decide how we use the space? That's, mm -hmm. that's the only thing. I didn't say... Uh, you're a scientist, no, that's right. Yes, yeah. I'm a scientist. I just <laughs> mentioned very clearly there's a space limit, and there is more <laughs> functions we need to fill in. So then we need to have a general, mutual discussion. How do we use that space? That's the, that's the only point I raised. So I'm very glad to hear that you have the discussion with the city ongoing. And maybe indeed there is, there is a car needed. But how yes. many cars? So one of the, the eight points which I didn't address in detail now is mobility as a service might be a huge solution. Yep. And mobility as a service is happening already more, but it will be a big challenge for a company like BMW because you're used to sell assets. Whoa, you're not selling assets maybe anymore. So that might ask for BMW to think over their business model completely. Yeah. So, and that's, whoo, the finance guy is getting very shaky because doing the cash flow estimations in the future with a new business model, if he's you're not selling cars anymore? No, yeah. he's in panic. So I understand it's a difficult one, but as a society, we should raise the discussions. That's the only point I made. So I didn't blame any way 
transport medium. Absolutely, you know. Interesting. We had this. We had this experiment in Berlin, and we were asking, um, uh, like, uh, some neighbors in a kind of special neighborhood in Berlin, if they would be willing to give up their car for only one month with a flat rate on just shared mm. shared mobility mm. cars. Mm. We put them i3s on shared mobility for free, but they had to park their car outside of the city and not touching them. Mm. We asked about 150 families, mm. eight of them joined, yeah. eight. Mm. They did not want to get, in, they were physically in panic because mm. they didn't have the car in front of the house. Even mm. so, they didn't move the car, 90% the car is standing in front of in your garage or in front of your house. Ninety percent. No. It's an interesting uh, calculation. M yes, but well, is, the questioning is the most important one. If you yeah. raise the question like this to this audience also, they will answer the same things. But if you put this question in the perspective of a long-term future, and you add also because who's a grandfather in this room? Who's a grandfather? Is there a grandfather? There's no grandfathers here? It is a year. There are. Yay. Good. Show your mobile and you've got your pictures of your grandchildren. If you ask the questions and also in view of their grandchildren and the space needed down there, answers might be different. So just asking a question like, this is a typical marketing thing in corporate. Basically, they ask the questions to have a, uh, a positive answer on the question they raise. So I think the discussion, eh, and I'm still not blaming, but the discussion should be done in a different way. We are joining the same space, and we should put the different options. And then you can have a more balanced discussion. That's stakeholder management, not the shareholder management. Shareholder BMW likes your question, but that's not the topic which I wanted to raise as a discussion. Interesting area. was that this question was held when we launched the i3, and this was yeah. around 2014. I know that. Yeah. Now, this kind of new um, approaches on mobility uh, uh, solutions, which implements everything, which is whatever you call mo mo mobility, mm. um, I think that is the, the future. And yes, also re-questioning your business models. Absolutely. And it is, you know, I, I think it's fundamental in, in, in a way that Everybody wants change. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to change. Like if I'd ask, you know, mm -hmm. are we ready right now to give up our patterns, our belief systems, our right in the moment? It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But we are all part of change. And change itself is a process. And it's inevitable. It's, it's a fact of life. Change is there. And even if you look within a life, you know, we've all, all of us, I mean, I, I believe I've seen some people in this room that have experienced a world with no internet. Um, there's a few of them, but they are here. Um, I've seen many people in this room that only have experienced a world with internet, for example. And um, so that change kind of unconsciously became a part of our lives and our systems. And we may choose to nurture that change or hold it back. And that has to do with narrative. And what I found very strong in all three of your talks is that you're actually very conscious of narrative and of the power of narrative. And um, so what I, what I want to ask you, for, uh, Aaron, because, but you're using a lot of narrative also in your story. You know? and it's, it's, I think that language in the end defines so much. It defines our belief systems. It's, um, I mean, in, in, in Dutch, when you sit in a car, we talk about the gas pedal, you know, if you want, if you want to push the throttle. We talk about the throttle in aviation. Exactly. <laughs> but is it still, you know, it is not anymore. Anybody who drives an electric car, it's not a gas pedal anymore. So we're changing these narratives one by one. And I believe that we have that in our hands. So, you know, this is probably a question, this is the last one I want to ask all three of you, is, is, is how do you apply the power of a change of narrative in your day-to-day -day work to make that systemic change over time? I think for me, if I want to get a project through, it is lucky that I have such an illustrious career of sales behind me because it helps that I I'm a bit tenacious. I do try and sell ideas. You said that in, um, in a corporation, in a large corporation, you're hitting walls. You're not. You're hitting people. 
non-stop. You're hitting people who are non-believers, and either you have to charm them, sell them, convince them, or you have to um, kind of go around them and slip around them like a snake and go to wherever you get through, which is not this blocking person. I think you, uh, you have an idea, you have to go and find, line up the, the people who are going to be co-believers, the people who are um, sharing, not the, not the other women, but the people who are sharing your kind of let's go attitude or people who are thinking a little bit further out. Maybe it's seven years out instead of one to two years out because the one to two years out people, they only see risk and they only see uh, change management and transformation and this is going to be difficult and what are the workers unions going to do? They're going to block everything and this is impossible. We will never manage. And I think that if we talk about this, the existential, uh, existential crises that climate change is presenting and this uh, congestion and all of the problems that we have, we really need huge, big changes and big solutions and you need to go out of the comfort zone and you need to rally the troops of people who have uh, a shared vision because it's impossible to do anything in a corporation by yourself. You only lose, you can only ever lose. You really need to at least get enough um, credible people behind you and with you to kind of co-sell this idea. And what we always need to do is we need to like massage top management from 50 different places and it takes maybe 12 to 18 months and then it's their idea and then bless our souls, then we have a movement in the right direction. But sometimes it's really like that and it is not their fault. Um, and this is probably going to be on YouTube and this is a, a problem for me, but it's not their fault. They have too many things on their plate, on their desk. There's no way for people at this level with all of this complexity to understand the technological or existential or whatever business uh, disruption that is coming if you cannot um, focus on the details and get really into it. This kind of corporate deep dive that everybody likes to talk about, these guys at this level, they have five billion problems and there's no deep dive time. And this is really, I think, the struggle that we have on a daily basis. Thank you so much. There's, there's perhaps a final question. I want to ask all three of you meditation in the workplace. Would that make a difference? <laughs> <laughs> What, what the question was? Can you repeat once? Meditation in the workplace. Is that going to change things? Uh, for me, it's not going to work, that's for sure. But yeah, people who are sensitive to it, I, I hear people applauding already. They're, they are, so. I think it I'm will work for you. I think you do it already. You, you just name it differently. Yeah, maybe I name it different. I'm, go I'm going out for biking, and then maybe that's my <laughs> exactly. meditation. That might be possible. Yeah. Because that gives me indeed a possibility to be surely with the air flowing around your head, a bit more freedom to think. That's correct. Uh, you don't have the direct boundaries of somebody saying, oh, not this, because this is not possible. So you have a bit more freedom of thinking. So if you mean that one, yes, absolutely. You need to sometimes have the time to reflect and consider things from different angles. Uh, so I think uh, you also addressed this earlier. So the, the longer term perspective might, might surely help down there also. And some of the decision makers might need this one even more. And uh, surely if you heard about climate change and uh, warming up uh, air cities, it has been suggested by some people already to take some political leaders, put them in a small uh, metal, uh, metal house in a hot sun and just let them sit down there, get some experience of feeling it. You're free of thinking. So the, sometimes these circumstances can help you also to think, oh, this is what we mean. And you may be much more creative to get out of that situation, which we need also as humanity on this planet at this moment. Thank you. And I you mean, uh, honestly, I, I, I wouldn't say that meditation would help, um, but I would rephrase this. I would say eat, sleep, pray and repeat. So it's the kind of like uh, envision what you want and do that continuously mm -hmm. in a kind of like re repetition and pray that this will work and repeat that. And also by praying you mean like adjusting your steering wheel so that you're Absolutely. continuously going into the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I think if 
If one thing I learned is you have to adjust always. You have to adjust with your visions, you have to adjust with your ideas, but also you have to be extremely flexible and don't be, don't be too stiff. And I think that's something when you learn that, it helps you also in life. But uh, yeah. I think uh, meditation is not in something we would probably do. <laughs> but uh, envision, envision uh, uh, your future and make sustainability. And it's something I want to say, and we said that, make sustainability and the action on sustainability sexy enough so that people love it. Don't make it a sacrifice. Don't yeah. make your work sacrificing people to do not doing things anymore or come and, and pr pray with this hand, but make it adorable, sexy, interesting, and something where you feel good when you do it. Power of design. Erin, any last remarks on this? Because I, I hear a cue somewhere in the background. Which is super cool. Yeah, yeah <laughs> the, uh, the comment of eat, sleep, and then cross out rave and <laughs> put pray uh, has been overturned by the yeah. background. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.